All right, here we go with lesson 39, our second and final lesson on section 11.2, ellipses. And remember, an ellipse is a set of all points in a plane, the sum of whose distances from two fixed points in the plane is a positive constant. Uh, the midpoint of the two foci is the center of the ellipse. And here's something. Actually, that sum d1 plus d2 always adds up to 2a. And you can prove this to yourself by picking the vertice, any, either of the vertices, and adding up the two. I just thought it was kind of neat that the sum of the d1 plus d2 is always 2 times a. Remember there are two axes, the major axis and the minor axis. The major axis connects the vertices. The minor axis is the shorter of the two and rather boringly connects the endpoints of its own axis. I got nothing. And remember our basic equation, uh, standard equation for an ellipse, the center at the origin, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equal 1, or it's at y squared over a squared, depending on uh, whether it's a horizontal, a vertical major axis. The major axis is uh, 2a, the minor axis is 2b, and the foci um, is c units from the center, where c squared equals a squared minus b squared. If the This one is the equation with the center at the origin. Uh, if we move the center to h, k, then it's x minus h and y minus k, uh, regardless of whether it's horizontal or vertical major axis. All right, let's do some examples. Let's find the equation. The ellipse uh, has its center at the origin, although you, you could have figured that out uh, from the vertices and the foci here. We're giving you the vertices, we're giving you the foci. So basically what we've done here is we've given you a, and we've given you c, and we need to find b. So a is 6, c is 2, so a squared is 36, and c squared is 4. So 4 equals 36 minus b squared, so b squared is 32. Um, because the vertices are on the y-axis, I'm going to put a squared underneath the y, and I'm going to put b squared underneath the x. And we got that from the fact that the vertices were at 0 plus or minus 6, which is on the y-axis. We can give you a, b, a, c, or b, c, and you should be able to figure out the, uh, what we need to get the uh, equation in standard form. Remember, c squared equals a squared minus b squared. a squared has to be the larger of the three terms. Moving on. Here's another one where we're asking for the standard form of the equation. Uh, vertices and foci are given, so again, we're giving you a and c. The difference here is the vertices are on the x-axis. So our a squared will end up going underneath the x squared. Let's move, uh, let's move on and solve this one. So the a is 7, the c is 2. So a squared is 49 and c squared is 4, again. So 4 is equal to 49 minus b squared. b squared equals 45. And because the vertices are on the x-axis, a squared goes underneath the x squared. And b squared goes underneath the y squared. So x squared over 49 plus y squared over 45 equals 1. Moving on. Now this one, we're telling you that the minor axis is of length 6, and the foci uh, are at plus or minus 4, 0. Now if the foci are on the x-axis, we know that this has a major axis that is horizontal, going right to left. The minor axis is length 6, so that tells us the value of 2b. So 2b equals 6. Now had we given you the major axis, you'd have had 2a, but we gave you the minor axis, so that's 2b. So b is 3. The foci are 4 units from the center, so c is 4. So b squared is 9, c squared is 16, c squared equals a squared minus b squared, so 16 equals a squared minus 9, add 9 to both sides, and a squared is 25. Now, and the reason I know the a 25 goes under the x squared is because the foci are on the x-axis. So my major axis is horizontal. The vertices have to be on uh, the x-axis, so in this case, you can see that a squared is 25, so what vertices would be at plus or minus 5, 0. Uh, so again, we can give you A, B, C, I have to give you two of them, but A, B, C, or C, or any combination, and we should be able to figure it out. Let's do one similar to this one. This time I gave you the horizontal axis of length 10 and a major axis of length 16. Uh, horizontal axis, length 10, we didn't tell you if that was major or minor, but it must be minor because we told you the major axis is length 16, so the major axis must be vertical. So this kind of lines things out for us. So the major axis is 2a, and the other axis must be 2b, because that must be the minor axis. So a is uh, 2a is 16, a is 8, 2b is 10, b is 5, a squared equals 64, b squared equals 25. Uh, and then the reason I know that the 64 goes into the y squared is because the horizontal axis wasn't the major axis. So the major axis must have been going up and down. So 64 goes into the y squared, 
and 25 goes into the x squared. Uh, now these get a little tougher. The vertices is at plus or minus 5, 0, and it's passing through the point 2, comma 3. So we're going to put together as much as we can, and then we're going to have to plug and chug and find out what's missing. So they gave us the vertices. That means we have a, which means a is 5, so a squared is 25. We know that's underneath the x squared because the vertices are on the x-axis. So we have s squared over 25 plus y squared over b squared equals 1. We're missing b squared. So we're going to plug 2 in for x, put 3 in for y, and solve for b squared. So 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9. Uh, there's lots of ways to do this. You could have multiplied both sides by 25b squared. I elected to subtract 4 25ths from both sides. 9 over b squared equals 21 over 25. Cross multiply 21b squared equals 225 and b squared reduces down to 75 sevens. Well, that's kind of a hassle because it's a fraction, but it's still our b squared. So let me show you what we're going to do with this. So x squared over 25, we knew that. y squared over the fraction 75 over 7. Well, we don't leave fractions inside of fractions. So we multiply by the reciprocal, and we get 7y squared over 75. Now, if we were asked to find the vertices and the, on the focus and all that, we would have to change it back to b squared being 75 over 7. But if we're going to walk away from the equation, we don't leave fractions inside of fractions. Moving on. All right. Arch of a bridge is semi-elliptical with the major axis horizontal. The base of the arch is 40 feet across, and the highest point uh, of the arch is 10 feet above the horizontal roadway. Two things, find the equation of the arch and find the height of the arch 8 feet from the center of the base. That's 8 feet to the right or 8 feet to the left. So we know it's 40 feet across. Your, your best bet on this one is to center it on the origin so that it's 20 going to the right and 20 going to the left. And we know that it's 10 high at the highest point, which gives away B. So the A is 20 because it's 40 across, so it's 20 in each direction. And the B is 10 because it's 10 high. And so A squared is 400. And B squared is 100. So this is the basic equation. Now this is the equation for the entire ellipse, as if the bridge company built the bottom part of the bridge. And I, I really don't want to get into the semi-elliptical equations. This is, this is good enough for our purposes and for us to do part B, which is figure out how high it is when x is 8. All right, here we go. I want to see how high the arch is, 8 feet to the right or 8 feet to the left. Wouldn't make any difference. So in other words, we want to solve for y when x is 8. So put 8 in there, 64 over 400. Uh, that reduces down to 4 25ths. If you can reduce it, your life will be much better. Again, you could multiply both sides by 100 here. I'm just going to subtract 4 25ths from both sides. And then I'm going to multiply both sides by 100. And I'm going to get y squared to be 84. And the square root of 84 is about 9.2. Yeah, uh, there's, there's not much drop there early. If you look at this thing, it really drops pretty quick as you, as you move a little farther out from 8. That's it. I plugged in 8, and I solved for y. I had to do some math, and I know most of you hate fractions. Sorry about that. All right. Now, up till now, you've probably been noticing some ellipses are very flat, and some are practically circular. And so to obtain information about the roundness of an ellipse, we sometimes use the term eccentricity or eccentricity. And it's simply a ratio of c over a, the distance from the center to the foci divided by the distance from the center to the vertice. E has to be a number between 0 and 1. If it was equal to 0, it'd be a circle. If it was equal to 1, it'd be a line. All right? So there's just a value E. Now, if C is getting really close to A, in other words, the foci are getting pretty darn close out there to, uh, to the vertices, then the ellipse is getting very flat, and E is almost 1. Now, if C is getting really small, in other words, we're really moving the foci close to the center, as C goes to 0, eccentricity goes to zero and the ellipse is almost circular. So as E gets closer to zero, it's getting more circular. As E is getting closer to one, the ellipse is getting a little more flat. All right, so the eccentricity in this problem is seven eighths and the vertices are at zero plus or minus 16. Now eccentricity is C over A. That's a ratio. That doesn't mean C is seven and A is eight. In fact, here, look at this, A is 16. So the a is 16, which means my a squared is 256. Uh, we don't need that right now. The eccentricity is 7 eighths. So I set that equal to c over a, which is c over 16. Uh, you can cross multiply and divide. I just looked at it and said I multiplied 8 by 2 to get 16. So 7 times 2 is 14. So c is 14. Oh my, that means we have c squared of 196. If I have a squared and c squared, I can find b squared. So we set the equation up. 196 equals 256 minus b squared and b squared comes out to be 60. 
So if I have a squared and I have b squared, then I can do the equation. Now look, the vertices are on the y-axis. So now you know which one goes underneath the y squared. So the a squared must go into the y squared and the b squared goes underneath the x squared because the vertices are on the y-axis. The major axis is vertical. It's going up and down. There you go. Do you notice that 7 eighths was C over A, but the C wasn't 7. The C was 14. It's a ratio. It's not equivalent. It's a ratio. So how does all this relate to planetary motion? Well, let's go back in time. Aristotle thought the Earth was the center of the universe, and here's the map he came up with. This is his universe, and you can tell by the date there that, that was a long time ago. Now, we know this is not true, but we got a long way to go till we figure out what really happens. Along comes Comprenius, and he determined that the sun was the center of the universe and drew circles around the sun, and said so everything rotates around the sun in circles. And that made more sense, but it still wasn't right. They couldn't get the math to work out. Then along comes Johann Kepler, and he came up with three laws of planetary motion. And the one that pertains to us is, number one, the orbit of each planet in the solar system is an ellipse with the sun at one focus. And that was a big deal, because he had figured out it was an ellipse, but he kept putting the sun at the center, which would have made natural sense. And he couldn't get the math to work out. And then when he moved the sun to one of the foci, all the math worked out. And so that's Kepler's first law of planetary motion. Uh, he has three of them. Uh, number two is kind of neat, if you really want to play around with that one. But the, for our purposes, the fact the sun is at one foci, which means we have one max distance and one min distance, depending on which side of the orbit we're on. So when we are on the one side, the max distance from the sun, it's C units to the center and then A units all the way out to where we're at. And so that distance is C plus A. Now swing around to the other side to the min distance from the sun and you're looking at C minus A. Again, the sun is not at the center of the orbit. It's at one foci. So max distance is C plus A. Min distance is C minus A. Now, i got to tell you, these eccentricities are really small, practically zero, so that's why it looks circular when they were first looking at it. So here's a problem. Uh, planet Mercury travels an elliptical orbit uh, that has an eccentricity of 0 0.206 and a major axis of length 72 million miles. Find the max and the min distance between Mercury and the Sun. Well, 72 million miles would be 2A, so A is 36 million. Eccentricity is C over A, so I set 0 0.206 equal to C over 36 million. Multiply by 36 million, and C comes out to be 7.4 million. Your A is 36 million. Now we just need to do the math, and we can wrap this up. So the max distance would be A plus C plus A. So 36 million plus 7.4 comes out to be 43.4 million miles. And the min distance is C minus A. 36 million minus 7.4 million comes out to be about 28.6 million miles. And so, again, these are practically circular uh, orbits. That's why the E's are all really small. Um, but again, there is a slight difference between our max distance and our min distance. Well, that's it for Lesson 39. Uh, well, man, only one more to go because Lesson 40 wraps up the whole semester. Uh, get to work on the homework. This takes care of Section 11.2, our discussion on ellipses.